Scotty, can you see me in that camera back there? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Good. <laughs> they can't see us though, right? No. Th um, did you want them to no, see you? No, no. I can fix it. No. I can fix it where no, they can see you. I'm right here in front of it. And oh, not, my goodness. There. Well, <laughs> here we are. And uh, we've got another two classes that are going this morning. Uh, this is the only one on Facebook. But then we've got Jeremy and Whitney Lind that are in the Christian Life Center, all warm and toasty with the heat on over there too. And then uh, Magdalena uh, Gonzalez is leading a third class. And we don't want more than about eight people in each class because when we come time for discussion and we're talking about things, then um, we want to be able to let everybody talk. If you get too many in a class, folks can sit back and not say anything. And you don't really grow unless you get engaged in talking about the reality of how God's word applies to your life. And the Bible says there's three things that affect you in your spiritual growth. One is uh, just your walk with God, you know, having time with God. Number two is your reading of the Bible. You can walk with God and feel good and feel bubbly, but if you don't have the truth to let you know what you need to do, then it's just limited to your emotions. But then the third way that God works in your life is through other people. That's why God designed a church for people to come together, fellowship, because you know what? I struggle. But it's a whole lot easier living my life of struggles when I hear your struggles. Life is like a marathon. Now, I've never run a marathon. Any of y'all ever run a marathon? I haven't. A marathon is when you run a long ways. Yeah. In fact, they look to see does, does, it's not so much who comes in first, it's who comes in, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so life is like that. It's long. And can you really keep going with Jesus with everything else going on? The best thing about a marathon is when I'm getting tired and ready to quit, I look over there and I see somebody else who's tired and ready to quit, but guess what they're doing? They're still running. And so that's what a small group is about. And if you're watching on Facebook, we all look forward to when we're going to be together and we can pray and hug and, and, and share together. That's definitely something that is holding us back. But right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to zero in on the study and uh, then we're going to talk about it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love and I thank you for how you have given us of your spirit power power that we can have to see our lives changed but you do it because of love because lord because of our love for you and what you did for us on the cross we're motivated to keep going we're motivated to keep becoming who you want us to be and lord because of a sound mind you give us the word of god to give us the truth that, Lord, we can have an accurate understanding of what you want in our life and not get distracted with how we feel about it or even how other people feel about it. Lord, I pray that this morning as we focus in this study and then also as we focus in our worship time, that you will help us gain clarity about how we can become spiritually healthier and how your work changes us in our spiritual walk. And Lord, we also wanna pray for the ones around us that we love, and there's so many. But Lord, be with Gladys as she is in Northside nursing home and beginning a new, perhaps, chapter in her life. She's not able to stand well. She's not able to see well anymore. And thank you for those around her that are loving her and helping her. Father, I pray for Alva, who's in Northside, who's going to be coming home, and Lord, for Missy, who's going to be setting up shop for her in her home, and Lord, the changes and perhaps some of the new things that they will be doing. Give them strength. Mary Jo and her upcoming biopsy, Lord, we just pray for your favor on that. Lord, for others that are on our hearts, you know what they are and who they are. Lord, we pray for your guidance now as we watch this video. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Make sure you got your book. 
Because this book, when you open it up, you're going to find a few pages over there, and it's going to have, uh, they don't have pages in it, but it says, Transformed in My Spiritual Health. These are your notes for the study. There's places to fill it in. If you need a pen, I've got some pens. Oh, anybody need a pen? Okay. And at home, if you are haven't gotten the book yet, this is going to be two entire months of study. You need a book. I've got about 40 books right now on the front pew of the church. And so tomorrow, call the church or email Sherry. Let her know that you would like a book. We will get one to you. So uh, please do that. This book, and somebody said, well, how much does it cost? Well, you know, it's costing the church about $15, but we want everyone to have one. If you can help pay for that, wonderful. Just write a check, give it to the church, however you want to do that. But the thing is, we do a lot. We pay a lot of stuff for money with money around here. We pay for the heat. And the heat bill alone this month is a lot more than every one of these 100 books that I bought. So the money's not the issue. The issue is you having the tools to be able to follow along. So we're looking at seven habits for spiritual health. And I'll say one more thing, and then we're going to jump into this. If you were to summarize what this whole study is about, it can be summarized to this. It's looking at your bad habits, reading God's word about the good habits you need to have. To replace the old. Does that make sense? You renew your mind. I've got to do these things. These are the good habits and the Lord's going to help. You. So let's go ahead and get this thing started. And I've got to focus in the camera, but we will do that right now. Lord willing, I've learned to say that when it comes to technology. <laughs> study of God's plan and God's promises for seven key areas of your life. Now in the next seven sessions, we're going to be looking at God's promises for your spiritual health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your relational health, your financial health, and your vocational health. I call these the seven key areas of life. Now God cares about every area of your life, and he wants to bless you in every area of your life. He wants you to be healthy in body and in soul and in spirit. And he has given us the steps and the principles in his word that we can take to live healthy, fulfilling lives, not just for our happiness, but ultimately for God's happiness and for his glory. You know, God's word is filled with his promises to bless every area of our lives. But with all of God's promises, there's always a premise. Did you hear that? With every promise, there's a premise. God says, if you do this, that's the premise, then I will do this. That's the promise. For instance, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, that's the premise, he will forgive our sins. That's the promise. The Bible says, in all your ways acknowledge him. That's the premise. And the Bible says, he will direct your path. That's the promise. Every promise has a premise. Now, over the next seven sessions, we're going to look at God's promises for each of these seven key areas of life. And we're going to discuss the premises or the conditions or the steps that we can take in order to live in God's blessing. Now, in this session, we're going to look at seven habits that will improve your spiritual health. We're going to start with your spiritual health. God has promised that if you practice these seven habits, they're all out of Scripture, He will bless you with strong spiritual health. So let's just start with the habit number one. If I want to be spiritually healthy, number one, I must love Jesus supremely. I must love Jesus supremely. That's a habit. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this. If you want to be my followers, you must love me more than you love your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. And that sounds pretty radical. But he says, otherwise than that, you cannot be my disciple. And what's he saying here? He's saying that you must love me, Jesus, more than anything else. Now, I want you to write this down. Spiritual health is measured by love. Spiritual health is measured by love. 
Write that down. Spiritual health is measured by how much you love. It's not measured by how much you know. It's not measured by your Bible knowledge. It's not measured by your skills. It's not measured by the words that you say. or It's not measured by how much you attend church. Your spiritual health is measured by how much you love. How much you love God and how much you love others. That's what Jesus said. In fact, in Mark 12, Jesus says this. The most important commandment is this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's passionately. And all your soul. That's willfully. And all your mind. That's thoughtfully. And with all your strength. That means love him practically. Live like you love him. Now, there's a word for this in the Bible. Loving God. It's called worship. Whatever you love the most in life is what you worship. If you love your boat the most, you worship your boat. If you love your job the most, you worship your job. If you love your body the most, you worship yourself. If you worship whatever uh, you, whatever you give your best love to is what you worship. God says this, if you want to be spiritually healthy, you got to love me the most. Worship me supremely. That's the first habit for spiritual health. Habit number two, you might write this down. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must meet with him, that's God, daily. I must meet with him daily. It can just be five minutes a day or ten minutes or fifteen minutes or whatever, but you make a date with God. You get alone with God, you just sit there and you be quiet and you say, God, is there anything you want to say to me? And as you talk to God in prayer about the things that are on your mind, and you let God talk to you through his word, that's, that's worship. And that's a quiet time. Now the Bible says this in Proverbs 8.34. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily. Circle the word daily. Watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. What is God saying there? He's saying, I want you to have a daily appointment, a daily habit of meeting with me. Now think about this. Why would God want you to spend time with him every day if he didn't want to spend time with you every day? You realize that? The God of the universe wants to spend time with you. This is important to God. He always shows up for his appointment. Do you? If you study church history, you find that every great believer, everybody who's ever been super blessed, super used of God, has had this habit of meeting with God on a daily basis. Again, it doesn't have to be long, but it does have to be habitual. You need to check in with God. Now here's habit number three for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must study and do his word. I just can't study it. I've got to study and do his word. Now, there are so many promises in the Bible where God says, if you get this book, the Bible, you get this book into your heart and into your mind, he says, I will bless your business. I will bless your family. I will bless your health. I will bless your finances. If you get this book into you and into every area, of life, wherever you want God to bless, you need to build it on the Bible. Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. By the way, what is the law of the Lord? It's this, it's the Bible. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And the Bible says, if you do that, that's the problem. That's the premise. Here's the premise. It says, he is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. In other words, you're going to be more productive. You want to be more productive? You need to meditate on the Word of God. That's a habit. Whose leaf does not wither. What does that mean? It means when the heat's on, when you're under pressure, you don't dry up because you've got deep roots. And the third part of the promise says this, and whatever he does prospers. Wow, that's Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Did you hear the premise and did you hear the promises? God wants to prosper you in what you do. But, here's the premise. He says, you've got to get into my word. You've got to study it. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to think about it. And, that, and you've got to do it. That's the condition. That's the premise to the promise. It's not enough just to study the word. You have to do what it says. Jesus said it like this in John 15. You're my friends if you do what I command. The book of James says the same thing. It tells us how to do this. It says this. The man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. What is the perfect law that gives freedom? It's the Bible. And continues to do this. In other words, it's a habit. It's habitual. 
The man who looks in the Word of God and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, that's memorizing, but doing it, that's acting on it, he will be blessed in what he does. And here's the fourth habit for spiritual health. It involves not your time, it involves your money. Over and over in Scripture, the Bible says this, if I want to be spiritually healthy, I need to tithe my income. Now what in the world does that mean? Tithe my income. It means that just like I give the first part of my day back to God, I give the first part of my money back to God. I, I, what I, 10 percent of what I give goes back to God. In other words, if I make ten dollars, I, I give a dollar back to God. Why, why in the world would I do that? Why would God ask you to do that? Well, God obviously doesn't need my money. But he wants what it represents. He wants my heart. And the Bible says where your treasure is, your heart is. Now I'll have more to say about that in our session on financial health. But the Bible says this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It's one of the great promises of the Bible. And if you're going through financially difficult times right now, if you're under stress about your money and your finances, if you are barely making ends meet, you need this promise. It's one of the habits for spiritual health. Malachi 3.10 says this. Bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house. By the way, what's the storehouse? It's wherever you worship. You don't give your time to some charity. You don't give your tithe to uh, some uh, uh, you know, foundation. You bring your tithe to the house of worship as an act of worship. He says, test me in this. I want you to circle that. Test me. I call this the Pepsi Challenge version of the Bible. He says, here's the premise. And see, here's the promise. If I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. He said, I dare you. See if I will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. God says, we're going to play a little game. You give to me and I'm going to give to you and we're going to see who wins. Now let me give you a personal example of this. I played this game with God for 35 years, and I've lost every year. When Kay and I got married, we made a commitment as a couple. We said in this marriage, God gets paid first. We may be in debt to other people, but we're not going to be in debt to God. We're going to put him first in our time and first in our tithe. I may be late on payments to somebody else, but I'm not going to be late on payments to God. God says, you want my blessing and your finances, put me first. So you know what we did? 35 years ago, actually now it's 38, we started tithing. And at the end of that first year, we raised our tithe from 10% to 11%. The next year, we raised our, uh, our uh, second year of marriage to 12%. The third year of our marriage, we raised our tithe to 13%. And we weren't doing this to show off. In fact, I didn't tell anybody about it for over 30 years. And the Bible doesn't even teach you that you have to increase it. I just thought, yeah, tithing blesses me. I want to be super blessed, so I'm going to play this game and give more and more every year. I'm going to see if I can outgive God. I'm going to see if I can be more generous every year of my life. So we kept raising our giving, being more generous every year, every year raising it more. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it was really tough. Sometimes the cupboard seemed pretty bare, and I'd go, Lord, I, I, I can't afford this. But then I thought, I can't afford not to. Because I wanted God's blessing on what was going on in my life, even when I was out of work. And there was times when uh, I didn't have any income. And, and uh, what do you do when you don't have any income? You don't tithe. You only tithe on what you make. You don't tithe on what you don't make. But every year, year after year after year, we kept raising our giving. 15%, 16%, 18%. The years I'd get a bonus, Kay and I would raise our giving 2 or 3%. The years we were financially tied, maybe we just raised it a quarter of a percent. But even in those lean years, I wanted to be more generous each year than I was the year before. Now, we've been married 38 years. Last year, we raised our giving, again, 1% from 90 to 91% of our income. And so now, we're more than reverse tithers. We give away 91% and live on 9%. And I don't even take a salary at Saddleback Church. And yet I live a very comfortable life. Now I'm not telling you this to brag about myself. I'm telling you this to brag about God. That you cannot outgive God. You know, I wrote a book called Purpose Driven Life. It became the best-selling book in American history. More than any other book except the Bible. Why do you think God did that? Why do you think God chose me? Not because I'm a great writer. But I know why. Because God knew what I'd do with the money. He knew I wouldn't spend it on myself. 
that we would just give it away. After I wrote that book, I could have bought an island and retired and had people serve me uh, little glasses of iced tea with an umbrella in them the rest of my life. <laughs> but the Bible says it's not about you, it's all about God. And I want to tell you, learning this habit, the habit of generosity, is as important as learning the habit of daily time with God and learning the habit of a quiet time with God, learning the habit of studying the Word of God. These are all important because I give God my tithe, my talent, my time. I give Him every year of my life. Now let's move on. Habit number five for spiritual health is this. That's a big one. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must learn to love other believers. Remember when we started off, we said God says life's all about love? Well, God doesn't want you to just love Him. He wants you to love other believers. Jesus said it like this. If you're going to be my disciple, you can't just love me. You have to love everybody in my family. Here's what He said in John 13. If you have love for one another, He's talking about other believers, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. He said, the mark of being a disciple is not that you just love God, it's that you love everybody else. It's not that you just love me, but that you love each other. This is the hallmark of being a follower of Jesus. It's not, it, it's not like people know you're a Christian by your bumper stickers. People will know you're a Christian by your little lapel pin. People will know you're a Christian by a t-shirt. No, God says, the proof that you are my disciple is that you practice the habit of loving every other believer. You love my family. You love the church of God. You love the family of God. You love the children of God. Have you ever heard anybody say this? Well, you know, uh, I love Jesus. I, I just don't like the church. <laughs> then they're not a disciple. Why? Because with all of its imperfections and all of its faults and all of its faux pas and all of its failures, Jesus says the church matters. It's the family of God. It's the bride of Christ. Jesus died for the church. The church is his family. So if you don't love the church, let me just say this. You're not going to like heaven. Because that's all who's going to be there. So you better figure out how to learn other disciples. Now the Bible says this. If somebody says, I love God and I hate a Christian brother or sister, that person's a liar. <laughs> that's pretty clear. God says, I'm a liar. I'm a liar if I say I love God and I don't love other Christians. Because if we don't love people that we can see, the Bible says, how can we love God that we have not seen? That's a passage in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Now, to be a disciple, you must love other people in the family of God. I want you to write this down, okay? Spiritual growth happens in community. Spiritual growth happens in a community. Not by myself, not by my lonely me. You cannot be a disciple by yourself. Did you hear that? You cannot be a disciple in isolation. You cannot be a follower of Christ without being in community because it's all about love. You'll never grow to spiritual maturity without a church family. You can get Bible knowledge, but you can't grow in love if you're not around other people. And in John 13, the Bible says, if you have love for one another, then everybody will know you're my disciples. Now circle that phrase, one another. Circle that phrase, one another. That phrase is used 58 times in the Bible. The Bible says we're to love one another, we're to uh, help one another, care for one another, we're to serve one another. The Bible says we're to encourage one another, we're to pray for one another, we're to greet one another, we're to support one another. But the Bible says over and over again <clears throat> that we are to care for each other. Now, we were put on this planet to learn to love. First, to learn to love God supremely, and then learn to love each other practically. Now, you have to have a church family. You have to be in relationships with God's people in order to learn how to love. You're not going to learn it sitting in a cave up in the mountains. <laughs> learning to love God and learning to love your neighbor as yourself are the two great commandments in the Bible. This is why being in a small group like you're in right now is absolutely essential to your spiritual health. You cannot grow without it. Why? Because you can't love the crowd. Let me say that again. You can't love the crowd. Now you can worship with the crowd. You know, 100 people, 200 people, 1,000 people or more. You can worship in the crowd, but you can't love. You can't fellowship with the crowd. So you need a small group, and you need to be committed in love 
the small group of other believers where you can love and encourage and support, and they can love and encourage and support you. Habit number six for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I need to learn to serve others unselfishly. A service is an important part of your spiritual health and development. Because God says, to grow, it's not all taken in. You've got to be given back. You've got to use those muscles that God gives you. You've got to develop your strength. And God says, if you want to be the most important person in the room, then you need to take the last place in the room and be the servant of everybody. The way to be great is by service. You have to give your life away. Jesus said it like this, one of the most important verses in the Bible. For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Now, I want you to circle the words, serve and give. I came to serve, and I came to give. In that verse, Jesus gives us the two primary purposes of life after worship. He said, I came to serve and to give. That defines the Christian life. The more you learn to serve and the more you learn to give, the more you're going to be like Jesus. And you know what? The happier you're going to be, the more fulfilled you're going to be, the healthier you're going to be, and the more blessed you're going to be. Because when you do that, God says, I'm going to pour out blessing on you. Now, why is this so important? Why is serving uh, such an important habit in spiritual growth? Because a lot of people go to church and they get fed and they get fed and they get fed, but they do no service at all. Because serving is like spiritual exercise. See, if all we do is feed, all we do is listen, we come to church, we hear great studies, or we, we listen to uh, preachers on the radio, turn on the radio, we listen, we go to a Bible study, and we study there, we're always taking in, taking in, but we never actually do anything. It's like eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and never burning any calories. You're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you get spiritually fat. And some people are so spiritually fat, you got to roll them down the aisles at church. And that's where we get the term holy rollers. <laughs> if you don't get spiritual exercise by serving others, there's no way you're going to develop spiritual muscle, muscle. And there's no way you're going to grow. And there's no way you're going to get the blessing of God in your life. That's habit number six, serving others. Now, finally, let me give you habit number seven for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must pass on the good news. In other words, what I've been given, I've got to give to other people. I've got to tell others the good news about Jesus. I've got to tell others that there's a purpose for their life, that they, they can be forgiven, that their past can be forgiven, they can have a purpose for living, they can have a home in heaven. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said this, Take the teaching that you heard from me, that I, I proclaim in the presence of many witnesses, and I want you to entrust what you heard from me to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. Now I want you to notice there are four generations in that verse. Paul says, God gave me the good news, and then Timothy, I pass it on to you, that second generation. He said, now Timothy, you're to pass it on to other people, that's third generation who are reliable enough to pass it on to a fourth generation. See, the fact is, you're going to heaven because somebody told you. And somebody told somebody who told you. And somebody told somebody who told somebody who told you. Here's the question. Very important question. Is the chain going to break with you? Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Or are you going to end the chain? Somebody told somebody who told somebody who told you. Have you told anybody? This is the seventh spiritual habit. You see, Christianity is always one generation away from just dying. If you don't tell somebody, then who is going to tell them? You're dependent on somebody else. You are spiritually sterile if you haven't told anybody about Jesus. Jesus says to be a disciple, to grow, you've got to pass on the good news. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said like this. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to do the same thing I taught you to do, to obey all the commands, to all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, that, that was the premise, here's the promise, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19-20. 
Now Jesus says, to be truly his disciple, you've got to be a disciple maker. In other words, you've got to tell somebody else. You've got to be willing to share your hope, share your faith, share your story with others. So let me challenge you with this. I want you to pray, Lord, help me to bring one person to you this year. I dare you to pray that prayer. God, help me to bring one person, not, not two, not ten, not twenty, just one. Help me to bring one person to you this year. You know what? If you start praying about your friends who don't know the Lord, and you say, God, I want to bring one friend to you this year, God will make it so easy. The reason why it's not easy is you're not praying about it. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. There's the promise and the premise. They'll come to Christ if you're being willing to share the good news. You just plant the seed, and God will make it grow. Now think about this. Can you imagine what it would be like to get to heaven one day, and you have somebody walk up to you and say, you know, I want to thank you. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. You told me about Jesus, and I am your friend forever. You see, if you could reach one person for Jesus, then you are doing what it takes to be a disciple. We're commanded to pass it on. Now, these are the seven habits for spiritual health. We're starting with your spirit. We're going to move on to the other six areas of your life in the sessions ahead. But let me close by saying this. If you really want to grow healthy spiritually, you want to be spiritually strong, you don't want to be a baby anymore, you're going to have to choose to grow. You're going to have to make some choices. You're going to have to develop some habits. Spiritual growth is not automatic. It is a choice. It's a daily choice but it has eternal rewards. But what do you call something that you choose to do every day? You call it a habit. Now, you've got to say, I'm going to quit being a half-hearted, half-baked, semi-pro, casual Christian. I'm going to get serious about this. I'm going to grow up. And I want to be healthy in every area of my life, physically, spiritually, mentally, vocationally, financially. But it starts with my spirit. Let me ask you this. Do you intend to be a godly man? Do you intend to be a godly woman? Do you intend to be as spiritually healthy as you can? Well, it isn't going to happen unless you choose to develop these habits. You need to say this. I'm going to choose to love Jesus supremely. That's a habit. I'm going to choose to spend time with him daily. That's a habit. I'm going to read the Word of God and I'm going to do His Word every day. I'm going to tithe faithfully. I'm going to love other believers and be committed to my church and be committed to my small group and be committed to community. And I'm going to use whatever gifts and talents and abilities God has given me to serve other people. I'm not going to live for me. I'm going to live for others. And finally, whatever I learn, I'm going to pass on to others. I'm going to share the good news. These are the seven habits for healthy spiritual growth. Now, I want to close this session uh, by praying for you and then leading you in a prayer. So would you bow your heads right now? I'm going to lead you in prayer in this minute. But go ahead and bow your head. And let me talk to you for a second. Again, you cannot grow spiritually healthy if you're not spiritually alive. There is no growth without life. You can't grow in Christ if you don't know Christ. So maybe that's the starting point for you in this session. Maybe you've known about Jesus, but you don't know him. Maybe you've heard of him, but you don't have a relationship with him. The Bible says that if I'm not alive in Christ, then I'm spiritually dead. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Have you been born again? You say, well, I don't know if I have been or not. Well, let's settle that one right now. It's pretty easy. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never opened up your heart, you never invited him to come into your life, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that's going to be the most important prayer you've ever prayed in your life. It's going to change you from death to life, from old to new, from guilt to forgiveness, from no purpose to purpose, from hell to heaven, from darkness to light. This will be the most important prayer you've ever prayed. And as I pray these words, 
You can just pray them in your heart. You don't have to pray them aloud. Just say, as I say these words, say, me too, God, me, me too. All right? Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Just say that. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I want you to forgive my sins, and I ask you to give me a fresh start. I want to be spiritually alive. Say that, me too, Lord. I want to be spiritually alive. I want to be spiritually healthy. And so I ask you, dear Lord, to help me develop these habits. I want to learn to love you supremely with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. And I want to learn to love other Christians in the family of God. And dear God, I, I want to continue in your teaching by learning and studying your word so I can be set free from the hang-ups that hold me back, worry and fear and anxiety and guilt and confusion. Say, dear God, I want to develop spiritual muscle by learning the habit of serving others. I want to learn to be generous with my money. And I want to pass on the good news. Help me to find one person that I can bring to you to become a part of your family this year. Now, Lord, I can't do these things on my own. I can't build these habits without your help and your strength. So, Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, I ask you to come into my life, put your spirit in me, and give me the power to do what you want me to do and what in my heart of hearts I want to be able to do. I want to grow healthy and become more like you by developing these habits. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. I'm glad you prayed. Here's the first thing you need to do. You need to tell somebody about it. Tell somebody, if you open your life to Christ for the first time, say, you know what? I followed Rick in that prayer. And let other people know about it so they can help you start growing. We're going to have a great time in this series. And we're going to look at seven different areas of your life. But it all starts with your spiritual growth. Begin to practice these habits this week, and God will bless you, and I'll be praying for you. All righty. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Okay. Go ahead and get that thing where it needs to be. I hope it's there. Y'all going to have to make sure I'm not cutting off my head when I get up there. <laughs> I can't see from this angle. I'm all right. Um, he's tilted this way. Yeah. Okay. Hey, don't down <laughs> Wait, okay. up or down? There you go. How's that? That's there. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. <laughs> yeah, you still. <clears throat> well, I'm so glad. You know, this is like looking at the Bible. You think you're doing all right, and, and then all of a sudden you look at the Bible and you find out you're about off a little <laughs> yeah. bit. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Hi, guys. <laughs> well, um, and and I is I didn't I don't have a clock. I usually watch the clock on the phone. I don't have that. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. It's nine thirty-five. Thereabouts. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm done before y'all are. So um, that's the thing. Well, these are seven areas of spiritual health. As I was driving here today, thinking about this study and also the message that God's put on my heart, I came up with a personal conclusion. I believe what we're hearing today could be and probably is the most important teaching for you for the whole year. It's kind of like Jesus said, if you build your house on a solid rock, the rest of it's going to be good. And we're going to talk about seven areas. But one of the main things, wouldn't you say one of the main things Christians need is spiritual health? I can tell you that's the main thing I need because everything else kind of springs from that. So we've gone over seven areas, so I encourage you, don't take this as just a study or another day, but really consider the car you're driving in, the spiritual house you're living in. One of the things, Raymond, you do is you check out cars. They have little lights that says engine, you know, check engine or maintenance, maintenance. And you put that thing on this machine maybe or something and then it tells you the codes that come up and you kind of figure out what needs to happen and you do that. Spiritually, we take God's word 
and we know that things aren't really right inside of us, how, what are some of the signs that you need to be doing better than you are? Is worry one of them? Fretting? Fearful? Anxious? You know, maybe doing things you're not supposed to do. <laughs> All those are signs. And so the key is, spiritually, how can you become more who you need to be? All right, so there's some questions here for us to look at. And some of y'all are just going to smile at me and look pretty. But some of y'all hopefully are going to talk. Uh, and uh, I found out where the page numbers are. <laughs> They're at the far side of the book. Some of y'all looking at me like, yeah. I didn't know where they were. but Because uh, I can tell you that on page 200. Yeah, those glasses help. On page 217 is a uh, page where you can actually write down prayer request. And so as you hear people say, pray for me about this or that, uh, there might be some things that you pray. In fact, you might consider that when you hear somebody saying, I need prayer for this, you got a page in this little group right here that you can write that information down. And on Facebook too. All right. So let's look on page nine. That's the questions that follow up this teaching this morning. And here's a good one. Now, what in the world seems to get in the way of your spiritual health or spiritual growth? What keeps you from growing spiritually? Me, myself, and I. Three people. <laughs> me, myself, and I. And you know, Polly, tell me more about that. How do you get in the way of your spiritual growth? Let other things get in. You know, the the world. Yeah, the whole world. Okay. So you, you've got this thing called the world that partners up with you. <laughs> and how does the world partner with you? How does the world affect you to be your own worst enemy? Pulls at you. It does what? Pulls at you. Okay, you're watching television. Yeah. And used to be think people would never think about living together. That was, no, you never do that. Right. And now... I hear people that are Christians saying, well, we're just going to live together for a year. And, yeah. Because Hollywood has glamorized it. Hollywood is a tool of the world to change your thinking Correct. and how you feel. All right? So me, myself, and I, I'm the one. What else would you say that adds to that that is in the way of your spiritual realm? Not reading the Bible, like, you know, okay. daily and... That's one thing I, not reading devotions yeah. that I should, yeah. you know, yeah. and like other people do. I led a person to church in Phoenix, mm -hmm. and I still talk with her. Mm -hmm. and she reads devotions, you know. And, and those are connections. You know what you're saying, Ed, is we all have done good things sometime or the other. Most Christians, you, you have. But the problem is being consistent. And what you're saying, reading your Bible, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of like eating the right kind of food. Now, if I would do, we're going to talk about physical, what helps hinders my spiritual growth. I'm scared about some of the stuff they're going to tell me I need to do. <laughs> because it's like, you know, there's certain things I like to eat. And to tell me that I need to be thinking healthy is, I'm kind of scared about that. You know what? I think fear hinders my spiritual growth sometimes. I wonder, as everybody was listening to this this morning and it got to the place of you need to tell other people the good news, how many people got scared right there? How many people got nervous? How many people felt like, I can't do that? Well, isn't that something that hinders our spiritual growth? Whether it's that or going upstairs and walking on the treadmill. I've had that sucker for a year upstairs and hadn't gotten on it one time. <laughs> Well, and, you should give it to me. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Debbie's using it. She's good about it. But then, I, you know, I just had to. <laughs> I just had to question because all this study is about if you love Jesus, you're gonna do what the Bible says about your spirit and the body is another one. And I had a thought as I was sitting there, you know, about to get something to eat. I had all this starchy stuff in there, but then I had a salad and some tuna I could put on it. And I thought. I don't like, you know, it's just not exactly the right, the way I want to roll. And so what hinders it is reading the Bible, doing the things, being afraid. 
of some of the things that you know you don't want to do. And even telling people, other people about um, Jesus Christ and the Bible. Yeah. Well, other people say, yeah, I know, I know. Then, okay, and uh, I'll let it go. If you want to go, if you want to go to church, that's your, if you want to go to church, that that's I good for you. Yeah. I can't force you to go. Right. I right. can't twist your arm. So you know what you're saying, Ed, is another thing that hinders my spiritual growth is other people. Because they're not doing it. I'm going to church and I can see. And sometimes we put people on a pedestal. Well, there's the preacher. He's not doing that. There's the deacon. My Sunday school teacher. They're not doing that. Then all of a sudden, people that are well-meaning people become the obstacle to what Jesus said for me. So I'd use this as an excuse. Or because they don't pat me on the back when I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. And so... That's too hard. All you right. Get our eyes off of Jesus. Yeah. The world and the causes of it. And that's another thing. I get my eyes off of Jesus. So let's go to the second question. It says, in the video, you learned about the importance of a daily time with God. How do you have a daily time with God? How do you do that? Debbie, you're a very busy person. I was going to say, my, my uh, what gets in the way of my spiritual growth is time, time or actually poor time management because, and then the second question, uh, you know, I answered, maybe I should just get up earlier because, you know, I work 10 hour shifts, so I mean, I'm pretty tired. When I come home, I'm gonna be just dead. But, you know, I could get up earlier maybe and have my time then. And then on my days off, you know, really make a point, you know, to, to take the time on the, on the mornings that I'm, I'm off. But time management is a big problem for me. <laughs> And I, I think that that is a huge problem with anybody that's still working. I mean, I have a huge advantage over everybody. My job is to spend time with God. <laughs> and so I spend a couple hours in the morning, you know, starting around six o'clock. And then after Debbie goes to work, another you know, an hour before, an hour after breakfast. And that's my job. It's, but I enjoy it. I do it, not because it's my job. But I think about, for instance, my daughter Shelly, who's got three kids, and they're trying to get up early in the morning, get them fed, and they're doing homeschooling, and they're trying to, and she's got 50, 60 emails after she gets off work that she's got to answer, and and then you know Todd's taking an extra class for fireman duty, so he's going to work plus doing that. He's not even home, but one day for the whole week, you know, to help her, and and so I'm thinking, well, how do you tell somebody like that you need a quiet time? Well, I'm just going to tell you something the Lord just revealed to me. Psalm 1, it says, meditate on God's word day and night. And I thought about it. You don't have to spend 20 minutes in a quiet time thinking that you have to block away that time. You can get your Bible and think, I'm going to read Proverbs and find a verse for me to think about today. You know what I do, Shelby? Um, like, like you said, um, I'll think about that when I'm getting ready in the morning to go to work. And um, I'll, I'll uh, you know, look on my, um, she reads truth. Uh, meditation it's just very very brief and then on my way to work I'll hit the you know you can't take some job so you, you know I, <laughs> I, I hit, the, hit the button and say you know I say uh, what's Kayla's verse of the day you know and, and my phone will answer me back exactly what Kayla's verse of the day is and then I'll start thinking about that verse all the way into work and, and so part of our work is to be in have ingenuity what do we have what tools do we have that we can use Something I found out about my phone, and I won't say because it it'll start doing, but I'll say, hey, and, and then I'll, I'll say, you know, scripture, love one another. You just use the word scripture and then say part of whatever the verse is, and it just comes up and it reads it to you. And, and so, so, you know, how do you have a daily quiet time with God is a very difficult thing to do when the time management part. Most people in the past, they had a farm, they got up, they were in charge of their time, you know. But you, you'll know, Raymond, being in charge of your time is still not an easy thing. Working for yourself is one of the worst bosses you can have. My time, I've gotten a good habit of it, is when I pick Avery up in the evening. Uh-huh. You know, I get there about 30 minutes ahead of time, so I get my Bible out of the bag, and you know, I spend my little 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, Catching you figured up, out catching up the rest of the day. Yeah, <laughs> you figured out a part of your schedule, picking but, but, up Avery, no, that, and being in us in the car for thirty minutes and in quiet time. Yeah, yeah. Phone not ringing. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, 
I struggled with this all through my pastorate. Even though I was a pastor and had time, I was only studying the Bible for a sermon or for a class. I was not personally just saying, all right, God, here I am. And I went to seminary and we had little kids and we had the same kind of thing that everybody else does. But when I came back here in 1990, I had on my heart, God, I need to spend time with you. And so I tried to get up early and I'd go to sleep reading the Bible. <laughs> Read the same scripture 10 times. And, and so, you know, that's when I started drinking coffee. I'm serious. <laughs> Never drank coffee before in my life. But I got me a cup of coffee, a cup of joe. And then I found out that playing music got me thinking about God, made me love it, felt loving God. Mm -hmm. And so I got coffee, I got music, and then that helped me. Because he, you might have time, but that might be as dry as a desert for you to really get into God, so to speak. Okay, so we know that's important. Um, you know, and it, it says there in the next question, why is being in a small group and serving others so important to your spiritual growth? What can you learn through relationships that you cannot learn on your own? Why is it important to be in a small group? More comfortable. Yeah. More comfortable? Yeah. yeah, yeah. To see that other people are struggling with the same thing you are. Yeah. But yeah. well, that helps me out so much. And Does, you get, you huh? get their ideas and their encouragement. Yeah, their ideas. Because mm -hmm. if we're all struggling, if you got people running a marathon, and y'all are the same group running the same marathon, and some of them seem to be doing pretty good, you're gonna ask them, well, how do you do that? Well, I eat, I drink carrot juice and beet juice, and I do this, and really, does that help? Well, it helps me. Now, I'm making that up. I, I'm not having read that anywhere. I'm just making that up. But don't you and I learn from other people? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, uh, Raymond, probably you, I know there's another mechanic, uh, Jason Smith, that I know, and when he's trying to figure out something that he doesn't know how to figure out, he'll call another mechanic. And in fact, you go online and there's things about this, there's YouTube videos and all of that. Being in a community, you hear from other people. How do you, do you ever feel discouraged? <laughs> <laughs> what is one of the worst things about being discouraged? What, what usually happens when you are feeling discouraged? You just gave up to begin with. You know? Okay, you, gave, you give up, yeah. You're thinking about self. Thinking about yourself. When I'm in a group, I forget about me, me, me. Thinking when you're in a group, you don't feel alone. Right. Usually when you're discouraged, you're feeling alone. That's self-pity. Yeah. Depressed. Yeah. And I've seen people come to a group feeling helpless and hopeless and leave feeling encouraged and like, I can do this. So... We understand being in the community is important. That's, you know, one of the things I thought about when I saw that is, and it's in my heart, how can we as a church grow our small group ministry? You know, because this is a study that people, that, I'm, I'm burdened about people on Facebook who are watching it by themselves and they might husband and wife talk about it and that's good. But you know, one of the things I hear all the time, people saying, I miss church. And what they're saying is, I miss being with people. My little small group is meeting with Evelyn and Cliff Benson. So, so yeah, because right. we miss church so much. So. Yeah, but, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Polly is saying that her she's meeting with a small group at Evelyn and Cliff Benson's house. And you got several other ladies, and they're making it small because of Cliff's immune deficiency and whatever, or risk. But to me, if we as a church are going to grow, we not only have to have our worship time, we need to have our small group time where we're studying something, but we feel like we're running this together. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, another question down there is, um, in, you know, in this video, Rick, uh, Pastor Rick said, spiritual growth is not automatic, it is a choice. It says, in what ways have you chosen to grow spiritually? What has been most effective in helping you grow? Um, would you agree with that, it's a choice? Y'all choose to, to get, y'all chose to get here this morning. Did y'all see my little thing I put on Facebook today? It had the peanuts and a little Snoopy. No. Snoopy was looking up at a, the people that are home probably still looking at that. It had, had Snoopy looking at a, at a nest, you know a little yellow tweeter bird? Sound asleep and his little feet were sticking up. 
And, and little Snoopy was looking up and said, this is Sunday. It's time to get up. <laughs> and you know what I, what I put a little thing there was we all choose to do what we you know, need to do. And the flesh says, roll over. It's a cloudy, you know, cold morning. Stay in the bed. Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, yeah, Super, yeah, Super Bowl Sunday. But the Spirit says, get up, get ready, get your Bible, and get to church. There's fire and love waiting for you for your heart to warm you up. And so it is a choice. You know, how far will you go? You're here in week number one. Will I see you in week number seven? <laughs> That's your choice. You might say, well, Shelby, it depends how good you do. You know, well, if you, you know, all right, I understand. No, it that. depends if an earthquake comes or. The rapture. The rapture. Yeah, yeah the rapture. That's the kind of people I like in a class. I'll be here unless the rapture happens. You yeah. Know? Right, right. Uh, hey, James, could you pull that door to, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. So the, we're going to close thinking here about on page 10. It says, putting it into practice. It says, my three month spiritual health goal. Now, we know that a goal is something you say in these three months, I'm going to try to do this, you know. But I'm not a good person for writing goals. I, I'm just, when I do that, I'm thinking, huh? You know, that's, that's too, I don't know. You know what is easy for me? Is for me to think, what are some habits I need to say no to? And what are some habits I need to try to have? Does that make sense? Spiritually. We just went through this, this study, loving Jesus. What are some habits? How can I help myself have a habit to love Jesus? What do you think? Isn't that something to pray about? Um, we talked about having a quiet time. And, and Raymond, you mentioned a habit. That has this, that, that's what I'm talking about. What are some habits you can think about doing? Debbie, you talked about a habit, using your phone. And so in everything you're doing, what is a habit you can do to intentionally say, this is my time to listen to God? And then um, study and do his word. Now that do part, that was me walking upstairs, walking a half a mile on that treadmill. <laughs> that was the do part. And that's, it's a habit. It, it, and it's like, and we're going to talk more about this in the message this morning. What gives you the motivation to do what you know you need to do. You know what it is? It's loving Jesus. Because when I thought about going up there, that treadmill, my first thought was I hadn't done it in a year. Why well, do I need to do it today? <laughs> but then I thought about the fact I am choosing to grow spiritually. And that means paying attention to all the areas of my life that Jesus is interested in, right? I'm wanting to grow in serving others. Yeah. I may be at home and feel poor pity me, but when I get out and go serve others, mm -hmm. I get a wonderful feeling inside. I get the blessing. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I know uh, before you close up, uh, I like serving others too. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in uh, Chattanooga, um, uh, I forget the name of the group. Uh, they, every Thursday night, they, uh, make food and they serve all the homeless all the homeless camps mm -hmm. and that I didn't go out with them but I helped them pound plates and pound forks and yeah. pound bags they served 150 meals on Thursday mm -hmm. and yeah. that's a good feeling to go out there and, and that's where the blessing spiritual health good spiritual health is going to bless you in the other areas of health and so we're, our time has, has come to an end, but let me encourage you right now to start thinking about something. Write these things down prayerfully as something you're going to look at all year. Let this be your spiritual growth manual for 2021. You know, in my heart, I meant it when I said I was praying, Lord, last year was a year of survival. I want this to be the year of renewal. And as I was praying that, an email came to me from Rick Warren, and I started reading about this study that he said every church needs to really do right now. Mm -hmm. And so what you have there is a three-month spiritual goal, but there's another place back there on page, it's uh, six toward the, the beginning. After you write down that on that one page, you can come and put it on this one page. 
And you know what that would be for me? I'm going to be doing it. You know what this is going to be for me? It's going to be things that I, the Holy Spirit's put on my heart that I need to focus on this year. I can promise you, I can just about promise you one thing. When we do the study about physical health, one of those is going to be being on a treadmill. <laughs> and I'm going to be looking at it. You know why? Because what we're going to preach about in just a minute, the greatest motivation you'll ever have for doing any of this is your love for Jesus. That's it. And, and, and love never fails. So we're going to close in, in prayer. And um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Miss, Miss Polly, if you would, to uh, just come up here close to this phone so they can hear you. And uh, it's not going to be filming you unless you want to get on this side over here where yeah. they can see you. <laughs> oh, she said, no, she thought, don't need she to do that. She doesn't want But uh, Polly, pray for us. Right pray here. that the Holy Spirit would help us in this study to become a church like we've never been before, one heart at a time. Dear Father, we come to you today, this beautiful Sunday day that is your day, Lord, and we just praise you for today. We praise you, Father, for the privilege of coming to thy house to study thy word. And we praise you, Lord, for the opportunity now to have this study of transformation in our lives, Lord. May the Holy Spirit just swell more and more in each of our hearts. Give us your love, Lord. We need more of you, Jesus. Yes. You are our only hope. Yes. And we just glorify you today. Mm -hmm. And may our voices lift up as we sing and praise your holy name in the sanctuary. And I praise you for all those that are coming today. Give Brother Shelby the words from you, Father. Not from him, but from you, dear Lord. We give you honor and glory and praise. And it's in the blessed name of Jesus I ask these things. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, pray for us. We'll see you here in about 10, 15. Get started there. God bless. Mm -hmm.